I've been wanting to talk about it. Uh, not necessarily the three films, but just the idea um, that you know a few people have been talking about here on YouTube lately, and um, the the philosophical sci-fi uh, futurist notion that one day we'll be able to download our consciousness onto um, computers of some kind um, that will put us in a virtual world that will be just as real as this world because it'll just be so uh, um, interconnected with our own neurons uh, and you know neurology at that point will have um, given us such a, a detailed and accurate picture of how the senses work and how perception works um, that we'll just be able to simulate it by going straight into the brain itself um, and uh, this idea, I think, um, it seems very attractive to, to a lot of people. Um, and I, I'm not sure if it's a minority or maybe it's a lot of people also who are quite frightened by this idea. Um, and there's probably a lot of other people who really can't make up their mind and don't know what it actually would mean for that to be possible. Um, I probably fall in that category because uh, you know on the one hand I can understand uh, that life gets its meaning because I don't know what it is um, and if we did know what consciousness was to the extent that we could simulate it um, you know that would amount to knowing what life was and and then not only knowing what it was but being able to control it uh, whatever you want you can have it. It's like ultimate free will. Or lucid dreaming. You know, you're totally in your mind. The world is your mind. And as long as the technology technology is advanced enough, you, you just can't tell the difference. In fact, a simulation in the end may turn out to be more real and more intense than, uh, than this world. Um, you know, if you can tap right into the nerve fibers uh, with very sophisticated um, electrodes uh, that hook up to a computer system, if you can get that direct link, I mean, you can really fine-tune a world. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, in Mentam is one of the people that mentioned the idea that we could possibly download ourselves onto some um, circuitry and live in a virtual world where everything was, was perfect or, you know, we can have whatever we want and that this would, this is a candidate at least for a solution to suffering uh, and something to really fix the world's basic problem, which is suffering. Um, but at the same time, Mendham would say that, you know, there's this objective reality out there and that's the world and if we don't pay attention to that, then we're lying to ourselves, and it's immoral and evil, even. Um, how can can someone hold both of those points of view at the same time? That it's a good idea for us to turn the world into our mind, um, and at the same time say that we have a moral obligation to pay attention to what the world itself is. I guess the way Gary made this, this leap and sort of connected these two ideas was he has such a... Uh, Gary in Mendham has such a distaste for this world and nature and his body and his emotions um, that he's willing to uh, label that as the objectively bad thing about reality that we need to get rid of. Um, and the only way he sees that we can actually get rid of that is to download ourselves into perfect virtual worlds. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical of that. Like I said, you know, I'm kind of in the middle about the whole idea because it seems like, well, first of all, we're making an assumption about what consciousness is. We're making the assumption that consciousness can exist separate from the body um, as nothing but electricity in um, a computer on a circuit board. And, you know, you, you could say, well, yeah, that's what it is now. 
Um, but there's something different about neurons and um, electrodes um, and circuits and microchips. There's something different. Um, you know, we say the neurons grow and the microchip was built, engineered, constructed, um, you know, kind of like Christians imagine that God made man out of the clay by just, you know, pulling out a piece, shaping it, stinking it on that side, and, and all right, I'll make it symmetrical. He stuck one on that side and, you know, carved out the, the, the face and the features and the, you know, the shape our skeletons we're going to take. Um, artific artificial intelligence, um, roboticists, and computer programmers, um, try to do exactly this. They try to build worlds from scratch, uh, from the ground up. Uh, and, you know, why would we distinguish that activity from growth, natural growth, the actual, the way of nature, the Tao, or ultimately what the physical world really is? It's this um, constantly changing, chaotic thing. It's growing. Uh, it changes... Um, in all locations at once, it seems everything is connected. Uh, and this isn't just New Age um, spirituality, this is quantum physics. Um, the hardest of the sciences says that non-locality seems to reign uh, in our universe. Particles are connected at a distance. Um, it's not possible for information to be sent between them. They are directly linked somehow. It, like the universe is a hologram. It's holographic, and you know holograms. When you break off a piece, it'll be um, exactly similar to the the larger um, picture that it was chopped off of. It and it, you know, it might be a little bit more blurry, but it's essentially a copy. You know, think of our genetic code. Each one of our cells has a copy of that code. You know, small mutations occur, and uh, you know, me as a male. Um, part of my organism is the female half of my species because, you know, every new organism that is produced is a result of two parents. And um, that's the link, the chain that uh, connects all organisms together. You know, ultimately we say the genes are immortal. They're not really alive. They're like viruses. Um, and from the, you know, neo-Darwinist or... Uh, you know, and from Richard Dawkins' way of approaching biology, it's really the genes that are in the driver's seat and um, the body and the uh, perceptual abilities and motor abilities of the organism are all just rooted in the genes. Even their ability to learn while alive after they've grown, um, it's still allowed by the genes. Um, not just allowed, but really controlled by the genes. Um, you know, and this would imply that there are certain genes in, in the human genome um, that allow for intelligence. Uh, that would be the implication. And that's why, you know, people, some people have a real disdain for evolutionary biology because it, it almost requires eugenics. It almost requires that, you know, we pick good genes um, when we when society decides what parents are gonna are gonna have kids um, or you know I guess we don't even really need to do it at that level we can just manipulate the uh, uh, the sperm and, and egg or, or the fertilized uh, uh, zygote in a petri dish and pick out which which genes we'd, we'd like it to uh, express um, and you know this all may very well be possible uh, it may very well be true that there are certain genes responsible for what we call intelligence, but that's the trick. What what do we mean by this word intelligence? How is the scientist, the geneticist, measuring this quality of intelligence that he associates to these particular genes? I mean, is he looking at um, matching, you know, the person's average income with the gene they happen to have, or um, their average level of education, or how genius 